This is CBC Television. The Postal Union rallies at the main depot. A report at 11 tonight. Friday, October 16th. Tonight, on The National, survival story, Jessica McClure's ordeal in a Texas well. Gulf threat, a missile hits an American flagged ship. And on the journal, the battle for the post office, bitter reaction from the picket line in the face of back to work legislation. And on Friday night, Sting, his new musical vision. The National, with Knowlton Nash. Good evening. A dramatic and emotional rescue tonight in a small town in Texas. 18-month-old Jessica McClure was pulled, tired, hungry, and thirsty from the abandoned well that had been her prison for more than two days. She's reported to be in good condition. The rescue work had been going on day and night at a frantic pace. Rescuers dug a shaft parallel to the well where Jessica was trapped. But when they broke through to her, they found her leg was caught in a crevice. But she still managed to giggle when a rescue worker touched her. And other rescuers reported that at one point, Jessica was even singing songs from Winnie the Pooh. Bones, groans, sometimes babbling like a little kid would do. When the jackhammer start up, she gets irritated and mad and kind of gets huffy like a little kid would do. Throughout the ordeal, Jessica's mother stood by with her daughter's teddy bear. Then tonight, after so many moments of false hope, Jessica was pulled from the shaft after more than 50 hours underground. It was a jubilant moment for parents and rescue workers. Doctors were on the scene and Jessica was rushed to a nearby trauma center. Medical history is being made tonight in Loma Linda, California, and a Vancouver boy born this morning is at the center of it all. Baby Paul was born with a bad heart. Just hours after he was delivered, doctors took him to the operating room for a heart transplant. He's the youngest person ever to have that operation. Keith Bogue sends this report from California. Baby Paul was delivered by cesarean section just before 11 o'clock this morning. And only hours later, he was in this operating room for a heart transplant. He's premature, but doctors knew months ago he had hypoplastic left heart syndrome, knew while he was still in the womb that he'd need a heart transplant as soon as he was born. Without it, he'd die within months. Wednesday, a donor was found. Baby Paul's mother flew from Vancouver to Loma Linda University Medical Center in Southern California. With the donor the was tested and found uh, suitable this morning. Baby Paul was delivered. Has red hair. Uh, and it is a normal looking baby. Five fingers, five toes, moving around. The medical team had it. one crucial control over the timing of Baby Paul's transplant. We were very interested in making sure that this heart was a good one because we had time, if you please, to wait for another one. Just a few hours old, he is the youngest person ever to have a heart transplant, the only one to have that surgery scheduled before he was born. Coincidentally, the donor was also from Canada, an infant, likely brain dead, but with a strong heart. Loma Linda is the world leader in infant heart transplants. The first, nearly two years ago, saved the life of baby Moses. He was just four days old then, today, he's fine. But it was two and a half months that we had waited. In February, this Calgary girl, baby Jessica, had a heart transplant. Her family has moved here from Alberta so they can all be near the hospital while she recovers. They say she's doing fine, too. A normal baby. <laughs> she's doing, she's right on schedule. She, she's ready to walk. There'll be some time before we know whether the transplant is a success. But if it is, baby Paul and his mother and a five-year-old brother will be staying here in Southern California for at least the next year. 
That's so the medical center here can keep an eye on baby Paul, just in case any rejection episodes develop. Keith Bogue, CBC News, Los Angeles. In the Persian Gulf, the tension between the United States and Iran has intensified. A missile believed to have been fired by Iran struck a Kuwaiti tanker flying the American flag. The ship burst into flames and many crew members were injured, including at least three Americans. The United States is calling the attack an act of aggression, and Washington is not ruling out the possibility of retaliation. Joe Schlesinger reports. The missile that hit the tanker Seattle City was the first direct attack on one of the 11 Kuwaiti ships given the protection of the American flag. A missile hit an American-owned ship yesterday, but she flew the Liberian flag. In today's attack, the American captain of the Seattle City and 17 other crewmen were injured. Observers said she was hit by a Chinese-made silkworm missile. The Iranians are the only ones in the area who own such missiles. So on the face of it, the Americans have reason for retaliating. They vow to protect American flag vessels, and they've said they'll take out the silkworms if Iran used them against American targets. In Washington, there was an emergency meeting of top national security officials, and the State Department condemned the attack. This is a very serious development. It is, in effect, an outrageous act of aggression by Iran. But President Reagan was cautious. We are in discussions with the uh, government of Kuwait, and uh, it would be very unwise to hint or suggest that anything we might do. Secretary of State George Shultz, traveling in the Middle East, hinted why the United States might not feel obliged to retaliate. Yes important to recognize the ship was in Kuwait. Translation, the United so States has obligated itself to defend U.S. flagships in international waters of the Persian Gulf, but not in Kuwaiti waters. But that's not going down well in Congress, even among doves who criticized Reagan for sending the U.S. Navy into the Gulf in the first place. When that missile hit a re-flagged tanker with flying the stars and stripes, it was no different than if a missile hit this capital. So the White House is under tremendous pressure tonight. If President Reagan does not retaliate, he's likely to lose what's left of his image as a tough and decisive leader. If he does retaliate, he risks escalating the Persian Gulf conflict with unforeseeable and perhaps uncontrollable consequences. Joe Schlesinger, CBC News, Washington. A destructive storm has swept through parts of Western Europe. At least 21 deaths are being blamed on the storm. The hurricane force winds have battered Spain, Portugal, and France. But Britain has been the hardest hit, with 13 deaths reported and damage in the millions of dollars. Jeanette Matthey reports. It's considered the worst devastation since the Second World War, the worst storm in Britain since 1703. Hurricane force winds, the highest ever recorded in the country, flatten trailer parks, demolish transport trucks, virtually close the London financial markets. It started in the early morning. It left roofs lying on the ground and people with harrowing tales to tell. About half past three, the kitchen window went, and then about 15 minutes later, the roof caved in, and my husband was trapped in the chair, and so was I. Off the south coast, this ferry ran aground. Whole sections of forest were flattened. At airfields, planes were flipped like small toys. And everywhere there were trees. Driving was almost impossible, and railway service to London non-existent. In the southwest, two firefighters were killed when a tree fell on their fire engine. This man and his dogs were lucky. They got out safely when a tree crushed their car. Must have been a bit of a shock, just like the bits. At Kew Gardens in London, one of the most famous botanical gardens in the world, more than 500 trees, a third of the collection, were damaged or destroyed. The people who work here say it's like losing their own children. Honestly, tears were in many people's eyes because uh, it's lifetime's work, uh, devastated in, in just one night. All day long, emergency services were flooded with calls. Many people could remain without power throughout the weekend. Officials say it will take days, if not weeks, before the cleanup is finished and life is back to normal. Jeanette Mathy, CBC News, London. Search teams in the Italian Alps have reached the wreck of an Alitalia airliner that hit a mountain last night in a storm. When rescuers got there in helicopters, they found no survivors. All 37 people on board were dead. 
Most of the victims on the turboprop plane were West Germans returning to Cologne after spending a vacation in Milan. The cause of the crash isn't known yet. The plane's flight recorder was found today. Prices plunged on North American stock markets today. In Toronto, the 300 composite index fell by more than 76 points. That's the worst single day loss in seven years. And in New York, the Dow Jones lost more than 100 points. It's the first time that's ever happened. Terry Molesky reports. A frightening week in the stock market ended with a nosedive in New York as the Dow Jones average plunged further and faster than at any time in history. Amid concern over trade figures and interest rates, a selling frenzy took over as traders scrambled to unload stocks at any price. Panic is a strong word. Defensive action is what I would use. I think the market's going lower and um, people would be wise to uh, get out of the way of the market for a while here. But analysts in both Canada and the United States are calling this a correction in the market and not a crash. They say that stock prices were just too high, but that the economy is still fundamentally sound and that interest rates are not going to go through the roof. Nobody is, is uh, going to uh, set off a depression, uh, at least not knowingly, through higher rates. We think the economy is going to continue to expand, that the trade numbers will improve uh, from current levels, and we would see corporate profitability continuing to expand this year and well, uh, well into next year. Whether stock traders share that optimism may emerge next week, when the market will decide whether to level off or to continue its downward slide. Terry Malewski, CBC News. journal life imitates art the eccentric outrageous down-to-earth susan musgrave when i lived on the charlottes i never even told people i was a writer because i wanted to be so inconspicuous i wanted to go to tupperware parties i wanted to you know have a, a vegetable garden i wanted to be able to soak socks like the other women from sea witch to earth mother to marriage to a former bank robber the many faces of susan musgrave coming up on the journal Sri Lanka's main rebel militia has called for a ceasefire, but Indian troops say they won't halt their offensive until all of the rebels surrender their weapons. The Indians went on the march a week ago in an attempt to restore order. So far, more than 500 Indian and rebel troops have died in the fighting. Tom Kennedy, our Asia correspondent, reports from Colombo. Indian soldiers are now closing in on Jaffna City, the last stronghold of the Tamil fighters, but the offensive has been costly. According to the Indian government, in the last week, more than 100 Indian soldiers and more than 500 Tamil fighters have been killed. Nobody knows the civilian casualties yet, but they're expected to be high. They're being killed accidentally and deliberately, like this young girl's mother, who was hacked to death by Tamil extremists. The terror is forcing people out of the north by the thousands, and they're making their way to refugee camps scattered around the country. According to some reports, civilians still stuck in Jaffna are now starving to death. The Indian troops in Sri Lanka were supposed to be peacekeepers. They were part of an agreement that was supposed to end the violence between Sri Lanka's Sinhalese majority and the Tamil minority. Tamils in northern Sri Lanka had been demanding independence, but settled for a promise of some political autonomy. The agreement was signed last July, and the great hope was that finally there would be peace. But the hope ended earlier this month when 15 Tamil fighters committed suicide while being held by the Sri Lankan military. The prospects now for a permanent agreement that will satisfy all sides seem slimmer than ever. Tom Kennedy, CBC News in Colombo, Sri Lanka. The leaders of the Commonwealth have reached some agreement on what to do about South Africa. A group of foreign ministers came up with a series of recommendations on how the Commonwealth can fight apartheid. Today, most of those recommendations were accepted. But Britain is still opposed to any more economic sanctions, and the British won't be going along with some of the key proposals. Our chief political correspondent, David Halton, reports. The summit leaders were isolated for most of the day at their Okanagan Lake retreat, trying one last time to bridge the gap between Margaret Thatcher and the rest of the Commonwealth on South Africa. Prime Minister Mulroney hinted they were largely successful. We have concluded our discussions and adopted substantially the report of the Special Ministerial Committee, chaired by the Right Honourable Joe Clark. 
But it soon became obvious that once again, Thatcher was refusing to go along with key proposals adopted by the other leaders. Among those proposals, the Commonwealth, without Britain, agreed to work for the wider application of existing economic sanctions against South Africa, and to adopt new measures, including more sanctions, none of which were spelled out. The Commonwealth also agreed to set up a committee of foreign ministers to monitor developments in South Africa. I think it is uh, a uh, very uh, significant answer to uh, some of those who might have been uh, suggesting in recent uh, months that uh, sanctions have been discredited. There was unanimous agreement on one issue, providing more aid for the shattered economies of the so-called frontline states that border South Africa. There will be a special fund for Mozambique to rebuild transportation links disrupted by South African-backed guerrillas. Canada will contribute $20 million. It was also agreed to help strengthen Mozambique's badly equipped army, although Canada, among others, says it won't ship any arms there. At a news conference this evening, External Affairs Minister Joe Clark denied that the agreement on economic sanctions will be ineffective without Britain. Without Britain, they will work. Uh, there is more to the Commonwealth than Britain. Uh, there is uh, more to the world interested in South Africa than Britain. British officials are openly belittling today's agreement, insisting it doesn't do much more than reaffirm the Commonwealth's existing and limited sanctions against South Africa. But delegates from other countries say the Commonwealth has at least succeeded in keeping sanctions alive, despite Margaret Thatcher's best efforts to kill them. David Halton, CBC News, Vancouver. Prime Minister Mulroney also confirmed today that Fiji is no longer a member of the Commonwealth. Mulroney says Fiji's membership ended when it declared itself a republic after a military coup last month. But he also said the door is open for Fiji's return. He said that if Fiji does ask to be readmitted to the Commonwealth, that might be considered if the circumstances warrant. The postal strike is over. The inside postal workers have been ordered back to work, and some of them should be back on the job by tomorrow. The federal government's legislation ending the strike got final approval this afternoon. The Canadian Union of Postal Workers is advising its members to obey the law and return to their jobs. A Nova Scotia teacher who carries the AIDS virus won't be back in the classroom on Monday. That's because Eric Smith has been appointed to a new task force on AIDS. The announcement came today. As Kevin Evans reports, the province has decided to act on what's become a very tense situation. Shirley Nickerson was going to keep her 10-year-old out of school on Monday. It wasn't a fear of AIDS, it was a fear of violence. I was afraid that uh, someone would really try to do something to Mr. Smith. They wouldn't let him in the classroom. This normally tranquil place has been in turmoil since the local school board decided Eric Smith would be allowed to return to the classroom. The 29-year-old teacher was initially pulled out when it was learned he carries the AIDS virus. Though he may never actually develop the disease, he can pass it on to others. But not, doctors insist, through casual classroom contact. Sable Island parents say they are not convinced. And until they can give me some answers, they're not going to see my children in a classroom where I know somebody's carrying AIDS. The more than 300 parents at this meeting planned a classroom boycott for Monday, the day Eric Smith was to have returned, and vowed there would be trouble. Today, a last-minute bid by the government to avert that trouble, a provincial task force on AIDS and education, with Eric Smith taking a leave of absence to be a member. It's not really a change of jobs. It's still educating. It's Instead of educating 10 and 12-year-olds, it's a matter of trying to educate adults. As for the parents of Cape Sable Island... They're really going to be relieved. By appointing Eric Smith to a task force, the government, for the moment, has diffused what was shaping up to be a very ugly situation. But health authorities are certain there are other teachers in Nova Scotia carrying the AIDS virus. They say it's just a matter of time before we see more controversies, like the one that has swirled around Eric Smith. Kevin Evans, CBC News, Cape Sable Island, Nova Scotia. Nancy Reagan is in a Washington hospital tonight for breast cancer tests. Doctors say she has a lesion that might be cancerous. The White House says she's agreed to have the breast removed tomorrow if the lesion does prove to be malignant. Former NHL player Brian Spencer has been acquitted on a charge of first-degree murder. The jury in West Palm Beach, Florida, took just an hour to reach their verdict. For 10 years, Spencer played in the NHL for the Toronto Maple Leafs and for several other teams. In January of this year, the 38-year-old former hockey player was charged with the 1982 murder of a Florida man. 
Spencer could have been sentenced to death in the electric chair if he had been convicted. The royal visit to Canada took the Queen to Regina today at the start of a five-day tour of Saskatchewan. And the first thing the Queen did was help celebrate the 75th anniversary of the opening of the province's legislative building. Jane Chalmers reports. Some huddled in the chilly autumn air for a couple of hours, waiting to see the royal visitors and then almost missing them. The Queen and Prince Philip haven't visited Saskatchewan in a decade. As they finally appeared, 3,000 people came alive with colours of the Union Jack. Your Majesty, Your Royal Highness, welcome to the province of Saskatchewan. We hope your visit will be enjoyable and rewarding. The visit began with the usual formalities. A 21-gun salute accompanied a military band playing God Save the Queen and the royal inspection of the Guard of Honour, a build-up to what people had waited anxiously for. Do you live here? In, in, hmm? Do you live in, in, in Ghana? In the walkabout, where people crowd for a chance to see royalty face to face. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. We're all, yes, we're Saskatchewan more brides. Thrilling. I just spoozy all over. <laughs> I could cry. Oh, I think we're still in a state of shock. <laughs> The royal family came to Saskatchewan to mark the 75th anniversary of the provincial legislature, a symbol of the monarchy in our system of government. Saskatchewan has a tradition of respect, indeed enthusiasm, for cultural diversity. This tradition is protected and extended through the historic institutions of Crown and legislature. This royal visit is the longest ever planned for Saskatchewan. The royal couple will spend much of the next five days away from politics, traveling to cities and towns, and socializing with thousands of people across the province. Jane Chalmers, CBC News, Regina. And that's The National for Friday, October 16th. Join us tomorrow for Saturday Report and The National with Jan Tennant. And This Week in Parliament with Don Newman. For CBC News, I'm Knowlton Nash. We'll have regional news later. Now, The Journal.